Um, when I agreed to take over the program coordinator position for WAS, I wanted to tap into the talent and expertise all across the state. And I sent out emails to a couple of birders I knew because I had been on field trips with them. And Mike Denny was one of those people. And my husband and I were lucky enough to be on one of the legendary Dionor Allen trips. But we also got to be on the first pelagic trip on Moses Lake, and it was an enormous amount of fun. So I thought, okay, Mike is a great resource. Perhaps he can have some suggestions or perhaps he would respond. But if you look at all the things that are on this list, I got back an email response from Mary Lynn saying, Mike is really busy with some projects right now. He can't, he can't do this right now. And it turns out tonight's program was one of the many projects that he was involved in. And I've asked Mike and his wonderful collaborator, Daniel Biggs, to introduce themselves rather than my taking all this time to do the same and to tell us how they came to create this, uh, the, the, the program that they're gonna share one of many episodes with us tonight. So at this point, I'll turn the, the stage over to Mike and Daniel. Welcome. Thank you. I don't know, is Daniel on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I guess I'll start out. Um, I first met Daniel, oh, it's been a good seven years ago. And he was filming a uh, walk that I was uh, taking one of the uh, interviewers from the television, Blue Mountain Television, on. And we were in the Art Rempel Natural Area, which is in Walla Walla. And we're talking about early spring plants. And Daniel was filming and I was walking along talking. And uh, at the end of the uh, interview, uh, Daniel said, hey, we ought to go and do a film together. And I said, OK, let's do that. Having never done a film together, I didn't know what that really meant, but it sounded fun. <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, grew up in Southeast Africa in the countries of Zambia and Malawi. Uh, my parents were teachers. My dad taught industrial arts. My mother taught surgical procedure. Uh, I came back to the United States when I was uh, 14 and uh, went to high school. And then I came to college in Walla Walla. I studied uh, biology, theology, and uh, art. And then the, my first job was with the US Army Corps of Engineers, which was not an enjoyable event. And I left them and went and joined the US Forest Service, which was an enjoyable event. And then I was asked to join the uh, State Conservation Commission, which I did. And I retired out of the State Conservation Commission. And uh, in the process after retirement, I have become busier than when I was working for those agencies. But in that process, I have met so many wonderful, outstanding people because I got involved with my community. And uh, Daniel was one of those outstanding, rare individuals that I have had the great privilege of working with. And it has been a phenomenal experience. Um, Dan and I have been able to, uh, we did another series earlier called The Secret Life of the Forest, the Northern Blue Mountains. And it is about the Blue Mountains from the I-84 corridor north to Pomeroy, Washington. And uh, that is viewable on YouTube. You can punch in Secret Life of the Forest and get a good feel of what that uh, episode, those ser that series is about. But um, Dan has been an absolute joy to work with and uh, his skill and professionalism is uh, unmatched uh, in my books. So uh, anyway, I'll let Dan talk. <laughs> well, that was a very kind uh, introduction and I'll write back at you, Mike. Um, you know, we went on this field trip at Fort Walla Walla and we uh, filmed some things there just and got into a groove and thought, hey, let's do this. And, you know, it's been a kind of a gigantic undertaking, but um, being out with Mike and, and 
learning and I love photography. I love being outside. And so also to have him explain, uh, you know, what I'm photographing, what I'm seeing and the days uh, of us filming would just slip by so quickly and it just felt like it was something um, we were meant to do is being out outside and looking at things and observing things. Um, and I guess the important thing to tell you about the series that we made uh, on the deserts in the Northwest is, is very unique. I don't think anybody has done any kind of production like this. Um, we're covering, you know, two thirds of Washington and Oregon of the high desert. And we have filmed over 450 different species of uh, plants, insects, animals, all kinds of amazing uh, things that we've seen. And, and to be honest, I, I think that many, many people don't realize what is in the, out in their backyard and what is in the high desert. And, and in consequence, it has been devalued. And so uh, it's been an exciting project to work on this with Mike. Uh, he has taught me so much and it's been such a joy to work with him. Uh, he's such a great friend as well. So, uh, but this is an amazing um, thing that we've done together. It's been a daunting task. I think, <laughs> um, I can't tell you the amount of hours we've spent driving in the desert and looking around thing for things. And I have to tell you one more thing. Everything in this video is something that we're walking and we're looking and it's just little treasures here and there that make up the secret life of the desert. So um, this particular episode we'd like to show you, nobody's ever seen before. Um, it's one that Mike has chosen and it's um, in an area near Lakeview, Oregon, which is central Oregon. And uh, so this is a new series coming out. You're the first ones to get to see this. So I hope that's exciting. Don't be too critical. It's two people uh, doing all the work and uh, I really do hope you enjoy it. Can't wait. Should I go for it? Go for it. Yes, sir. Get ready, folks. Keep your fingers on your volume button. Let's see here. Anything worth having is worth waiting for. This morning, we're standing out in one of the most beautiful desert areas in South Central Oregon. We are near Cabin Lake. This is an area that is a transition zone between the Shrub Step community and the Ponderosa Pine Forest. And we are standing in a spot that is just crawling with wildlife. One of the creatures that is here right now by the dozens are least chipmunks. This is the smallest chipmunk species in the Western United States, and they live in the shrub steppe as well as the Ponderosa shrub steppe. And by shrub steppe, I mean the sage and rabbit brush and bitter brush and bunch grass and 
that community is incredibly important to wildlife because of all of the seeds and the insects that are attracted to this area. We like to think of chipmunks as being pretty benign and a very pleasant little animal. They in fact are an omnivore. They eat insects, they eat seeds, they eat all kinds of things that you would not expect. They eat birds and nests and eggs and young. And the amazing thing about these chipmunks is that they are so common in this habitat here. Today we probably saw 12 to 15 least chipmunks right at this one water hole that we were at. Another rodent that is in the area is the golden mantled ground squirrel. And they are about a third larger, or maybe 50% larger than a least chipmunk. And they are basically a rock squirrel. Golden mantled ground squirrels live around basalt rims and rocks, and they are great collectors of vegetation. And this time of year in September, they are collecting grasses and seeds and taking them underground into their burrows and storing those food items for the dead of winter in case they wake up. We are in a transition zone here. And the important thing about transition zones is that they provide lots and lots of habitat in areas, say that we were standing in just a shrub step. We would be missing a lot of the birds that are obligated to live around Ponderosa Pine. If we were in a strict Ponderosa Pine forest, we'd be missing those birds that are shrub step obligate species. So we'll start talking about them. One is the Brewer's Sparrow, which is a shrub step obligate, requires sagebrush. But right now, the first week of September, they are in migration. And so now we find them in the transition zones and coming to these pools of water. They are very small sparrow and they are a sparrow that nests in sagebrush and it's Kind of unusual in the summer to find them anywhere in an area with lots of big ponderosa pine, but not during migration. They go through here by the hundreds, probably hundreds of thousands. Another species that lives here in this area are, because of the ponderosa pine, are large numbers of, one of my favorites, the pinion jay. Pinion jays are in this area, and it's a mix of shrub step and some juniper, but mostly ponderosa pine and shrub step. And they live here by literally flocks of hundreds. We had a flock yesterday that was here, probably 150 plus birds. And they are steel gray blue. The adults are very blue. The younger birds, hatchier birds that were hatched this year, are more gray 
and not so much blue. They are truly a vociferous species. Uh, you can hear them coming and going from great distances, and they are always in flocks. In fact, I hear them right now. Another species that's here in large numbers and is entirely obligated to the ponderosa pine is a Clark's nutcracker. The pinion jay and the Clark's nutcracker are cousins and they all belong to the family of Corvidae. So another species of bird that arrived at the pool today were white-headed woodpeckers. White-headed woodpeckers are a ponderosa pine obligate. They are not found in the shrub steppe. So to have them come in, we had four of them come in today, absolutely gorgeous. And this is a bird that excavates cavities in stumps of ponderosa pine and in dead snags of ponderosa pine and they live deep in these cavities. They lay their eggs in these cavities. They roost in these cavities. And for them to be out feeding all over during the daytime, it makes it pretty hard to locate them. And to have four of these absolutely stunning, black-bodied, white-headed birds come in and be drinking and bathing right in front of us was an amazing experience. Only the males have red on their nape. They have a white head, white face, black body, and big white wing patches. White-headed woodpeckers are found all over the west coast in ponderosa pine forests. They also occasionally show up in ponderosa pine western juniper forest mix, but they love ponderosa pines. So it's really nice to see them. Another species that's here is the green-tailed towhee. And green-tailed towhees are not ponderosa pine obligate birds, but they are shrub step obligate birds. And they love rocky rims, especially with bitter brush and mountain mahogany. Well, there is no mountain mahogany here, but lots of bitter brush. And so we have green-tailed towhees and they have a beautiful rust red cap, a green body, and they are really a species of sparrow, but they're larger than most sparrows.
Another species that showed up at the pools today was a Vesper sparrows, which are about a third larger than chipping sparrows or brewer sparrows. And they have a beautiful white eye ring around their eye and a beautiful little rusty red shoulder on their wing. And they are a shrub step species. And to have them in the ponderosa pine is very nice, but they are also in migration. In fact, all the birds but the resident white-headed woodpeckers are in migration, along with a large number of yellow rump warblers. Yellow rump warblers are insectivores, and they come through here by the thousands during migration. They typically nest in higher mountain ranges. They love dug fur, and today they're moving through the shrub step and the ponderosa pine on their way south, getting out of this the northern United States because winter is on the way and they know it. Another species that is in the area that I thoroughly enjoy and that is the white crown sparrows. White crowns do not nest here. They're in migration and they have been coming to the water here. And the sub-adults, which are here, have rust red stripes on their head, and the adults have black stripes on their white head. And they are an absolutely beautiful sparrow, and they're in migration, headed down into central California and on into Mexico. So really an interesting bird. They nest in Canada, so it's fun to see them here. Another species here is the white-breasted nuthatch. White-breasted nuthatches are a ponderosa pine obligate. And so they are only here because of the pines. And this particular subspecies has an extremely long bill because they feed on insects that are under the bark of the ponderosa pines. Another nuthatch species that's here is the pygmy nuthatch which is absolutely beautiful little nuthatch. They're the smallest nuthatch in the Western United States, and they're super vocal. They get in small flocks, and it sounds like maybe 10 or 12 birds, and there'll be three. But they are entirely obligated to live among the ponderosa pines. Another species that we saw some of today were the red crossbills. Red crossbills are entirely a ponderosa pine obligate species. And this particular type of red crossbill feeds on the pine nuts within the pine cones of the ponderosa pine. And they have a crossed bill and a huge thick tongue and they can pry the leaves of the cone open and reach in with their thick tongue like a parrot and pull those seeds out and that's what they devour. And so we had a large flock of red crossbills come down and start drinking. Young and the females have greenish yellow on them and the males are brick red and they have dark wings and truly a beautiful, beautiful finch. But they are so unique because of their crossed bill. Really an amazing bird. Right now, there are at least 10 different types of crossbills in North America, and probably more. So right here, we, we just call them red crossbills because it, many of them are moving around right now, and they're looking for cone crops. And in areas where there has not been a good production of pine cones, they bypass. They do not spend any time there. Really an important bird. A lot of them will drop pine seeds, and those seeds end up on the ground, and they grow. They germinate when the moisture comes. Right now we're in a drought, and this uh, soil here is bone dry, and there's no moisture 
and the plants are stressed and the birds are looking for water. So the amazing thing is, I happen to know that there were several pools here and they are kept full by volunteers who come out here and put water in them. And so we filled one of them with five gallons of water today and the birds are just here by the hundreds drinking. So really important sources of water for them. This is a very well-known site by Oregon birders and it's well worth a visit. This afternoon, we're standing in one of the most amazing forested areas in Eastern Oregon. It's called the Lost Forest. This is an area that is a mix of Western Juniper and Ponderosa Pine. And what's so interesting about this is it is an incredibly harsh desert area. Most of these trees are growing on old dunes. And both Junipers and the Ponderosa Pines have a certain interval between plants. And because neither of them have big long tap roots, most of their roots are within a foot of the surface of the ground. They rely on spring snow melt or rain. And that's what they store in their roots. Well, the demand for moisture in this forest is incredibly intense. And so this interval is maintained between the trees. And there are no thick stands of anything in this forest. It's all widely separated because as the root systems increase, the demand for more and more moisture increases and they push out and destroy any other trees that are trying to get established. Super important to remember is that the Western Juniper probably lives as long here as the big Ponderosa Pines do. The Western Juniper also hosts large numbers of bats, reptiles, and amphibians. And many, many rodents and birds nest inside these juniper trees. Western junipers are incredibly important to Oregon's native wildlife. And the amazing thing is the older they get, they usually get hollow, and all kinds of animals utilize those hollow trees. So they're actually a living snag. The outer bark on one side or a couple branches will be alive and producing berries and the rest of the tree will be dead. And loads and loads of wildlife utilize that. So if you're ever tempted to go out and cut down western juniper just to get rid of them, don't do it because so much wildlife depends on it. Western juniper are native to eastern Oregon and parts of eastern Washington. All over the Great Basin, they are a native tree. And many, many wild animals have adapted to use them. So be very cognizant of that. The other thing to remember is that the big ponderosa pines here are all growing on sand dunes. And ponderosa pines do not have a big, heavy taproot. Every root is right up against the surface of the ground, 
so they can collect any moisture that falls or melts and they store it. They store it for this season. Right now, it's probably 90 degrees here, wind is blowing, and there is no moisture on the surface of this soil. And yet these trees all survive. They have all kinds of strategies for survival, and one is they start dropping needles and leaves because they can't afford to maintain all of them. The thing to keep in mind is that these plant communities have very rigid strategies that they live by to survive. And one little thing can totally destroy this plant community, such as overgrazing, too many ORVs in this area, all kinds of destruction of habitat. And that is a real loss that takes many, many, many years to regain because it is so hot and so dry here. Another area that we had the privilege of visiting was the dune system, which is just southwest of the Lost Forest. And this is an area that is very reminiscent of the Sahara Desert. Big, huge dunes, blow areas. It's just massive area. Most people would never think of this dune system as being in the state of Oregon. And the amazing thing about it is it's full of wildlife. So if you walk across the dunes, there are stands of Indian rice grass everywhere. And then there's a bug loss relative growing out there, a plant. And around every one of those grasses or bug loss are rodent tracks. And they come every night and they go around each plant and they're looking for insects to eat that hold up there through the night. There's Great Basin Jumping Mouse and Ord's Kangaroo Rats, and I could see their prints everywhere, and also their burrows. So they burrow into that sand and outweigh the heat of the day. And as soon as the sun is down, about 45 minutes, they start coming out looking for seed to eat and insects. So really a wild place. The other place that we visited was Fort Rock. And Fort Rock is this massive caldera in the middle and an uplift, tough geologic formation. And it's made from compressed ash, pumice, and bits and pieces of basalt. And it rises high into the air. And over the many thousands of years, it has eroded. And it's created these designs and burrows and tunnels and columns and you name it. All of the face, the western face and all the way around Fort Rock is utilized by wildlife. There are turkey vultures that nest there, canyon wrens that nest there, golden eagles nest there, prairie falcons nest there, fruginous hawks nest there. So it is an amazing place for wildlife. And this time of year, in the early fall, it's very hot there. And so the whole western face of the rock is pretty much abandoned by this time of year. And they all hang around on the eastern face in the shadows. Loads of rodent skulls, leg bones, and everything along the base. And that's where birds of prey have been eating rodents and then they regurgitate pellets. And those pellets fall down the hundreds of feet to the floor along the edge and bottom of the tuft wall and then those pellets disintegrate and leave those bones everywhere. 
The area has a trail, a game trail, all the way around it. It's a pretty amazing sight. It looms up out of the desert, and you can't miss it. Fort Rock is an amazing place to visit, but it needs your protection and your care, and please don't litter. Thank you. That was a treat on so many levels, the visuals, the narration, the wonderful music and the background. This was just brilliant, oh, just brilliant. Thank you. Glad um, you enjoyed it. Absolutely. I, I'd like to offer you the opportunity if you want to make any comments about it and then encourage our audience if they would like to um, ask their questions in person. I think it's appropriate to unmute yourself. But um, Elaine is going to um, share the questions that were typed into the chat. I yes. think a lot of people are going to say, oh, where exactly is that? I'd love to go there. <laughs> yes, Mike uh, and Dan, if you could uh, repeat, you said Central Washington and if I'm sorry, Central Oregon, but there were several people who were really keen to know more precisely where the lost forest and the dune system and Fort Rock and so on are. They're down in uh, along the edge of Christmas Valley, which is east of Lapine, Oregon, and Silver Lake. And uh, it used to be Christmas Valley was a vast shrub step desert. And now it has 500 center pivots in it that raise alfalfa. Oh my God. And so all those thousands and thousands of acres of shrub step have been obliterated to raise alfalfa. And the alfalfa all goes to Asia. It is sent to Asia. Um, the interesting thing was they're pumping water out of the aquifer there. There's a vast underground lake and they're using all that water to raise alfalfa, which I guess I view it as kind of a loss because alfalfa is not a great food source for human beings. And I think our world, as we continue to explode if, with the human population, are not going to need more alfalfa. <laughs> but anyway, that's my, my personal opinion. <laughs> well, you're right. And it's been pointed out by quite a few environmentalists uh, how we're robbing our state, uh, not only our state, but by taking the water that you've just so preciously provided um, and then sending it in tankers to China. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, here's a question. Uh, the, well, there was a question on the music, which was a very early question. Daniel, that's your area. Could you tell us about the music you used? Uh, well, that was from a uh, subscription to Artlist. Um, they provide uh, royalty free music. And so you pay a certain fee and that allows you to download music and, and they are kind of a trendy, um, kind of good source for music. And they seem to have a lot of updated stuff. And so, uh, it seemed to be a pretty good match and, but it takes a long time to find the right piece of music. I mean, it really does. It takes about an hour per minute to edit this stuff. <laughs> it sounds crazy, good but Lord. It really does take that long. Well, well you got a lot of explaining to do, Daniel. A lot of explaining. <laughs> you got trail cams. You got drones. Um, was that a blind, that that boxy brown thing that was behind Mike near the beginning? Yeah, we yeah we have 
have it all. <laughs> well, yeah. could, could one of you tell us more about that water source? I mean, that gorgeous uh, built pond that, that is it has to be has to be filled by hand and you all went there but there's is there a group that uh, takes turns yes there is uh both of those there's two pools there and they were constructed by the um bend birding club <laughs> bend oregon and they are east of lapine oregon uh and it's called cabin lake which is neither a lake but there is a cabin there. So, <laughs> but the interesting thing is uh, they've been, they built those in the 1990s, uh, early 90s, early late 80s. And uh, they have kept them full of water every fall and summer. And thousands and thousands of migrant birds depend on those pools of water for surface water to drink. And if you go sit in the blinds there quietly, you will be astounded. I mean, it is the most astonishing thing you will ever witness. It uh, really was. It was like, uh, you know, that scene in Walt Disney's, um, what is it, uh, Snow White. And I mean, just all these animals <laughs> coming together out of the, it was just, I've never seen anything like it. And it was an, it's an amazing photo opportunity. It was, it was, we spent a lot of time in those blinds it, and it was a real joy. There's, could, could you tell, uh, you go, go ahead. I was just going to say, we didn't comment on it, but at night bats come into those and you had a short few seconds there of the bats uh, coming in to drink from those tiny pools. Uh, but there is no other water for miles and miles and miles. And so the bats have come to rely on that surface water as well, as do loads of insects come in to drink at those pools. So if you go there, take a couple five gallon drums of water with you to uh, help refill those pools. Well, that brings us directly to, could you have us give us some idea of what it took for you to, to get there to one of those water holes? And, and what is this land? This is uh, BLM land or what? It is. It's BLM land. Bureau and of Land Management for the less... Uh, correct. Lettery people. <laughs> and it took that white rig that we're standing by in the photo there uh, yeah. to get us there. <laughs> hey, hey, Mike, uh, there's a comment. I've been having such a fun time with these uh, chat. There's a chat coming through and I've been trying to keep up with all these conversations because I, of course, I've seen this a hundred times. Uh, and it's been so fun seeing the, the comments and questions. But one of the questions was, do you have any idea what type of bat those were? Uh, probably big brown bats. Uh, <laughs> I did not see any silver hairs or uh, any hoary bats there. Uh, they mostly looked like big browns. And there were a couple of little brown myotis that came in as well. We did have a question on another species wondering whether yellow pine chipmunks frequent this area. Uh, we saw a few there, but they were far outnumbered by um, the least chipmunk. Well, if anyone has any questions, uh, but I think Mike, you're, you're just winding up to tell us a bit more about some of your conservation thoughts and philosophies and reflections well i'll yeah. tell you um whether we know it or not way back when the malheur refuge was taken over uh by uh, a group of individuals that had an uh, an amazing impact on federal employees and these areas that once were patrolled and maintained and enforced are not being so at the rate they used to be for fear of personal life and liberty. Um, so there are a lot of people out in the deserts of the Northwest pretty much doing what they want to do. And that is um, indiscriminately shooting animals, uh, littering, I mean, dumping trash all over the place. And the thing that's very sad is 
that these individuals think it's their right. And they just soon all these lands, these uh, public lands, end up in private hands. That's what they would like to see. They would like to see them farmed. They would love to see the trees cut for logs. They want to see a huge change. And the bottom line is, these are our public lands. And so we need to be very protective of our public lands, and we need to be very vocal about the protection of our public lands. And so if we have a chance to support federal employees that work for natural resource agencies, uh, speak up, do it, because um, our public lands are under tremendous uh, attack from uh, many groups that just don't see the value of them and want the resources off of them. And so um, I can't urge you enough to be protective of our public lands. 90% uh, of what we filmed in this series are, was on public land. And it was done intentionally that way so that you know that you could go out and see all those plants and animals and they're all on public land. And they're there because we have managers. We have the BLM and the US Forest Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. They do a certain job and they are hired to do that. And when we have um, problems with groups that think that that is against their rights, um, we need to re-educate. And we need to be very protective of the, both these agencies and of the land. Daniel, you have anything? Oh, no, I'm just, uh, I'm enjoying the chat again. <laughs> I, I'm kind of, uh, I was admitting kind of a sad, that, you know, um, there, there are some sad things that we witnessed, you know, and I, I was kind of a layman coming into this. And Mike has had his eye on the desert and in this area and watching things change. Uh, and things are turning over to center pivots and um, the shrub step is just kind of being eradicated pretty quickly. And uh, it's um, in, in one time, uh, you know, we've seen just some terrible things too. It, you know, it, it's, it's been a, so much joy, but to see what mankind has done to some of the, you know, I just posted uh, on a chat that we came across about a dozen coyotes piled up one time and it's sad it's incredibly sad to see and unneeded and uh and so that was kind of the some of the painful things to uh, to witness when we filmed this we we also had some amazing experiences out there and uh, just Absolutely. to counter the kind of negative things we've said but i every time we went out we found unexpected species and many times uh, that we went out, we were after specific species because of the time and the um, habitats that we needed to enter. Um, so one evening we were um, down south of uh, Malheur Refuge, uh, southeast of the Steen Mountain, and we had a kit fox go in front of us in the state of Oregon. And that was unbelievable. This tiny little adult kit fox running across the road in front of us. We found many of their burrows, but we did not find any active burrows. So, but it was such a joy to see a kit fox. Um, they were discovered in Oregon in the 1960s uh, by a gentleman that was doing research on um, neotoma or bushy tail wood rat nests. And he found a kit fox skull in a wood rat um, collection. Uh, and that's the first time that we were, humans were alerted to the fact that there were kit foxes in the state of Oregon. There are no known kit fox in the state of Washington at all. But um, it was just a joy to actually see one. So, Mike, I got another question coming in. It says well, we have uh, several questions above that one, Daniel. Let me just take uh, oh, this sure. one if you don't mind. Uh, there was one about fires, wondering if there were these areas were affected. There were fires in the Lakeview area last year. Does that connect with anything you can comment on? Yeah, we came across vast burned areas. Um, hmm. 
Many of them were arson. Uh, some of them were lightning caused, but most were arson. And many people want to graze their cattle. And they see shrub step uh, plant communities as inhibiting the grazing of cattle. And so they set these beautiful shrub step areas on fire. And the BLM is supposed to put them out. Well, when you have shrub step that's five, six feet tall, it burns hot and a high wind behind it. It's very difficult to put out. And the problem is uh, every summer, these individuals keep lighting it up and they want grass planted there. They want to graze cattle. And so I've reached a point in my life where I really doubt that shrub step can remain shrub step and cattlemen can have their way as well. So can I can I put a tiny uh this is this is totally passive and there may be some people on this Zoom uh meeting tonight who also last week attended a talk given by ooh, which Audubon but the gentleman was a representative of pheasants forever and although they started as hunters they were giving his talk gave a great example of great working together overlap in trying to preserve and enhance shrub step by doing things like i'm sorry i don't exactly know if it was these junipers or others but they um, were actually with blm or forest service removing trees in parts of shrub step because the shrub step the the sagebrush will grow back in various uh, plants. Could you make a comment on that? You bet I'll comment on that. <laughs> we came across vast areas where the western junipers had all been cut down. They were laying on their sides. And this was done in, at the behest of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. And they cannot graze cattle under junipers because there's no grass under junipers. Uh, junipers produce um, several chemicals that retard or totally eliminate the growth of other plants under them. They acidify the soil with their needles. And so cattlemen hate juniper. They can't stand it. And they get, try to do everything in their power to get rid of it. Uh, they, they work that through their uh, congressional representatives. Uh, they... Uh, urge money uh, sent to agencies to cut down all the juniper on the properties that they want to graze. Uh, the BLM and, and Forest Service are under tremendous pressure from Congress to get rid of juniper. The problem is Western juniper is irreplaceable when it comes to wildlife. Um, many, many species of raptors, uh, both the owls and hawks, uh, depend on juniper. Uh, that's where they build their nest platforms. Uh, that's what they depend on. Uh, juniper provides vast amounts of shade. It provides uh, big old trees are hollow and loads of reptiles, amphibians, insects, bats, and all kinds of other mammals uh, utilize juniper. And so the very notion of wiping juniper out so cattle can graze is a biologically incorrect, to put it bluntly. And um, Lots and lots of uh, people in some of the agencies say that um, juniper is hard on water. They say that it sucks up the shallow aquifer. Western juniper has been here for hundreds of thousands of years. And for the very notion that this is a native plant that has to go to satisfy a small little group of people is nuts. There, that's well, my that's comment. Very very, very, very strong. Uh, let's go go to something a little uh, more lovey. We want to go back to that water hole. Uh, number one, was the Crossbill group at the same water hole as your others? Were you at just one water hole? And we're interested in knowing how one finds and gets to this water hole at the right time with our gallons and gallons of water. For one million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the water hole is between Silver Lake and Lapine, Oregon. And there is a sign that says Cabin Lake right on that highway. Okay, that's the mystical Cabin Lake. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, we'll give you Mike Denny's email and you can ask him if you are really going to set out. Actually, his email is really fine, easy to find. <laughs> um, Daniel, I don't know, were you about to approach the ones about uh, wind farm, solar, and so on? Oh, I was just going to ask Mike. He could probably answer that question better than I can. He's the, the question is, is there a controversy there in Central Oregon? Or yeah, let's see if I can. It says, the question is, Mike, is there a controversy there in Central Oregon, as in Eastern Washington, to use the land for wind farms and solar production? Um, not so much in Eastern Oregon, uh, mostly Northeastern Oregon. Um, I've been involved with wind energy since 1997. And what I've discovered is that there are operators that want to do everything in their power to minimize bird and bat mortality. And then those, there are those that don't give a rip. And I've worked with all kinds of companies, all kinds of wind uh, developers and companies. And what I've discovered is that they caught the Pacific Northwest flat-footed. Uh, neither Oregon or Washington had any rules or laws protecting wildlife uh, from wind farms at all. So for two and a half years in Washington State, uh, Blue Mountain Audubon, uh, three of us, uh, pretty much were the law in eastern Washington uh, in dealing with wind turbines. Uh, our own state fish and wildlife would not do anything. And then we went and sat down with DFW uh, leadership in Olympia and explained to them the problem. And that was bird and bat mortality at these wind farms. And nobody knew uh, the number of birds being killed or the number of bats. In fact, they didn't even know the populations of bats they were infecting or affecting. And they had no idea the population of golden eagles in Washington state. They had no idea about the bird populations at all. And so these wind turbines were killing these birds, they're killing these bats, and we have no idea the true impact that they're having. Um, I represented Blue Mountain Audubon and for a while State Audubon. And what we discovered was that because we didn't understand the population dynamics of all these species that were being impacted by wind farms, um, some data collection needed to be taken. And the environmental consultants that worked for the wind energy companies were collecting numbers, but that's not the numbers I wanted to collect. I didn't want to collect mortality numbers, although those are important. I wanted to collect the living numbers. What were we taking these population mortality from? What was the impact on these species? And we still don't know to this day. We're flying blind there, literally. And so um, I have lots and lots of questions about wind energy. Um, solar energy depends on the model and the type that they put up. Uh, right now, when they do large solar uh, commercial farms, they tend to ace out all the habitat and just blanket it with solar panels. Uh, they need to reassess that and not do that because it's loss of tremendous amount of habitat. And um, they can place them further apart, higher off the ground, and allow native vegetation to grow. So anyway, that's that. <laughs> Very good. Um, Mike, how do you feel about your email being put into the chat so people can reach you if they wish? That's fine. Okay. And there's a new question. What cameras were you using, Daniel? And were the videos shot in 1080p or 4K? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I should probably write down the list of all the equipment that I use. Uh, we had a couple GoPros. And I got a story about where I lost a GoPro on the side of the road and somehow we found it about four weeks later, uh, thanks to the sheriff's department out there. But uh, we have, I, I, I went through a couple drones. Um, I, we, you know, the first series Mike and I did was Secret Life of the Forest, uh, um, the Northern Blue Mountains. 
And I'm like, Mike, I can't film that bird. You know, he's pointing to a bird that's a quarter mile down the road. And I'm like, I can't film that with this lens. And so he helped me buy my first kind of big lens, but it was a point and shoot camera. And this had a, uh, it was a Nikon P900 that had, and so that kind of got our start. But after things got funded for the second series, I was able to buy uh, a little better lens. Uh, and so I have, so a lot of the wildlife shots are shot on a uh, 600 millimeter Nikon lens on a D7500. Um, you know, we had two trail cams, uh, sometimes three trail cams. Uh, anyways, you know, and I definitely used a lot of macro lens. So I used the big lens and the macro lens and the wide angle lens. So, you know, it seemed like every situation had a, uh, a tool that would, you know, work in that scenario. So it was just about being well equipped with different tools for different situations. In some situations, I would, of course, shoot in 4K. I love that. But in some situations, we were filming butterflies at super high speed film rate. And I was shooting that in high definition, um, maybe at 240 frames a second. Uh, so until I can shoot 240 frames a second in 4K, I'll uh, have to take high definition. But uh, anyways, so a lot of different cameras uh, for different um, jobs there. Uh, and then we had a big 4K on a on a tripod that I'd film Mike doing all the narration. And of course, we'd use a microphone on Mike. And I found a way to film Mike in the wind, because often you have wind out in the desert. And I found a very cheap little um, uh, hack that we could tape a microphone inside his shirt. And so Ooh. if the wind came up, we could still have nice, good, clear audio. So, Wow. <laughs> There's the Matt, text answer. <laughs> Matt Bartels was so kind to zippily pick up the eBird hotspot nice. list for Cabin Lake. Hot uh, for Cabin Lake, someone had asked uh, <laughs> if you had to have four wheel drive and how you could get to that spot. So that's in the chat at the bottom. Also, Matt very kindly found the Secret Life of the Forest episode on YouTube. Link. Those Matt YouTube. says. Uh, Matt says to Mike, "How did you get Mike to clean up so well?" <laughs> yeah. it was a miracle That's... it's dark out there That's right. That's right. i think we have run through if anyone has written in a question that we've missed i mean there are loads of compliments and thanks for the gorgeous work you did and the landscape that most of us will never have the chance to put foot on um the narration the wonderful um uh, format of the whole thing so that's all nice unfortunately silent clapping going on well it's been a joy i have tears in my eyes from just uh laughter and joy and it's really amazing to be a part of something like this with mike um you know it's uh, it's i feel like it's very special and it may not be your polished nature show that we've come to appreciate but I think there's something that takes this series on a deeper level and uh, and I'm really excited about it and it really feels good tonight to feel that hear that com uh, the comments and the the feedback is very reassuring and it means a lot so I want to tell you I thank you. I, well, we have we have I, maybe the best uh, last question perhaps it's not maybe the last one but what's your next project. <laughs> Time. <laughs> Well, time time we're, we're, we'll let yeah. that we want wow. vacation vacation yeah. is my next project <laughs> um just a, a couple comments um we've discovered that the deserts of the northwest stretch all the way from american camp on san juan island clear down to what's called lookout lake in the very corner southeast corner of oregon and uh I always get a kick out of folks that come from the west side of Oregon or the west side of Washington, and they tell me they've been into the desert of Oregon or Washington. And one gentleman told me he had been to Leavenworth and he had seen it. And I was like, oh boy. Um, and I had another guy tell me one time he went to Sisters, Oregon, and he had seen the eastern side of the desert. And it's like, there's so much more to the deserts of the Northwest. And so Dan and I created this uh, series 
to educate about the value and the incredible beauty of the deserts of the Pacific Northwest. And, and because they're so valuable and they're so beautiful and they're so full of life, um, they, have, they are seriously a uh, type of land that needs our protection and our attention. And it has been politically uh, that a lot of people say they're just waste ground and it's of no value. Well, that's the most inaccurate untruth that's ever been told to American citizens. And uh, we did this series so that folks would come to appreciate and enjoy the deserts of the Northwest. Thank well, you. And, speak and speaking of uh, aiming a, a little bit to that younger generation that all hope is laid upon, one question that I, I'm sorry I missed earlier, this would be wonderful to share with the school age population. Do you have any plans or suggestions for that? Go ahead, Dan. Oh, heck, I don't know. Uh, you know what? I'll maybe Mike, you could tell a little story that we about that young man you oh, met. Tell that story. Yes, yes. Tell the story. Okay. <laughs> so, I was out uh, guest lecturing at uh, Walla Walla Community College, and I handed out the nice little card you see in the middle of this photo I'm looking at, with the multiple photos on it and Life of the Desert and. I was just handing those out to the members of this class. And this kid looks at it, uh, and I call him a kid. He was like 24, 23, 24 years old. He stood up and he says, I'm here because of secret life of the forest. And I said, what? He goes, I'm in college, I'm a senior, I'm going to have a degree because of secret life of the forest. I said, how's that? He says, I was sitting there watching this one evening, and he said, and I was paying attention to what you said. And he said, I suddenly realized that all of life is about the relationships and how we maintain and build them. And he realized that his life he had always destroyed relationships, and he was going nowhere. He was addicted to alcohol, drugs. He was in all kinds of trouble with police. And he said, I realized my life was going down the tube because I had blown all my relationships out of the water. And he said, I watched this whole series. He said, it caused me to reassess my life. And he said, I went right down the next week and signed up for college. And now I'm graduating. I'm the first person out of my family to have a college degree. And that caused tears to come to my eyes. I couldn't believe that our series had had an effect on one young man's life. Had no idea that that happened. So that causes Dan and I to think that, you know, this particular series yeah, the, uh, several uh, BLM, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have all asked to use this as an educational source, as a resource, and uh, schools want to use it. So that's why we did it. And it is something that um, could possibly and hopefully change people's views, philosophies, and what they're doing with their life. Because... Uh, I'll tell you, conservation has never been needed like it's needed now. And um, because we have a lot of opposition that's more greed than need. And uh, this is an opportunity through these, this series and Secret Life of the Forest uh, to help get those uh, messages across here in the Pacific Northwest. So Daniel, this is Vicki, and can you describe a little bit how people can see the, the many other episodes that uh, you filmed as part of this series? For one million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? Uh, so we have Secret Life of the Forest. We had the first episode on YouTube. Uh, but then if you go to secretlifetv.com, uh, you can download the episodes. I think they're high definition episodes if you want, or you can get the DVD. Um, we'll eventually probably put those on um, YouTube, but for now we're still uh, 
encouraging people to support the program. And then the secret life of the desert. We're gonna we're gonna have a special premiere here. It's gonna be kind of a highlight reel here in Walla Walla at a fun theater called the uh, Gisa Powerhouse Theater, May twenty second. We're gonna have two showings. Um, I think one's at seven, and one's the other one's at two or three o'clock. I, I three. Sure. It's on the screen right now. Oh yeah. So um, we're still working out some of those details, but I believe it's it's either gonna be two or three. So you know, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and they're going to be doing a little marketing for us. And then we're going to have by that premiere, I'd like to have the DVD ready, the series ready. And if possible, I got to go the extra mile here. It'd be neat to get it on to Amazon Prime, uh, you know, and people could just stream it because, you know, people don't download as much and people don't want DVDs as much. People want to stream it. And so I'm thinking uh, I may have a, a route to get this on Amazon Prime, and that would be super awesome if I can pull that off. But we'll we'll see. So, well, right now it says on June fifth at seven p.m. You can watch online at That's right. www a Blue Mountain Television yep. uh, TV. Yep. And um, so will you show this episode or a different episode as the first as your as uh, uh, well, on June 5th at 7 p.m., or, or yeah. have you decided? So we're, so I do work for Blue Mountain Television, and, of course, they get first dibs on the showing, and we, of course, love to have you tune into Blue Mountain Television and watch that. Um, and, again, June 5th at 7 p.m., it's going to be the first episode of Secret Life of the Desert, and uh, we're going to run through the first nine episodes, and uh, but believe it or not, we have about 17 episodes uh, and so we're going to have an, a, another second run, um, kind of like a kind of like a two season thing. Um, so, but yes, if you could watch online for free, we have a free Roku channel. All you have to search is Blue Mountain Television. I think I don't know what the condition of that um, uh, stream is at the moment. We're doing kind of a revamping, uh, but you can always tune in to our website. At that time, uh, we have a live streaming at www dot bmt dot tv and you can watch it uh you know uh 7 p.m on on those evenings so. wonderful and we'll have a new episode every week so i can't thank you enough for sharing this with us this oh, has been, have been such a rich you've been evening very, you've been very kind and generous everyone thank you thank you very much really really appreciate it and uh, to our audience, thank you again for signing in. We hope to see you next month when uh, our program will feature the special birds of Mount Rainier uh, with uh, Jeff Antonellis Lap. And wish you all a very good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs>